Every day, people go to work. And very often, a major part of who we are is shaped by the job we do. For the coal miner who excavates the earth and the fisherman who harvests the sea, life and livelihood are dependent on the kindness of nature. When disaster strikes, the way of life of entire communities is at risk. October 23, 1958. Halfway between Moncton, New Brunswick and Truro, Nova Scotia, the community of Spring Hill is enjoying a spell of Indian summer. In the late 1800s, Spring Hill had been Nova Scotia's boom town, the province's largest producer of coal. The number two mine was one of its most productive, and the future looked bright. By 1958, times have changed. Coal is no longer the bright light of the future, and the number two mine is the only one still in operation. On this particular Thursday, Miner Maurice Ruddock heads off to work. Married for 13 years, he and wife Norma have 12 children. He was a happy-go-lucky man, always laughing, carrying on, and he loved to sing. That was the big thing. And he sang a lot in the mines, I guess, and going down the trolleys. Miners Gorley Kempt and Wes Reynolds celebrate the warm weather with ice cream. Like Maurice, they work the late shift in the number two mine. On their way, they pass the White Miner Memorial, commemorating the men who have died in the mines of Spring Hill. By the end of the day, many more names will be added to the list. Shortly after 3 p.m., the afternoon shift of 174 men takes the mine train below the surface. The number two mine has always been the most productive, but to get the best coal, the company has had to dig deeper and deeper. Number two mine uh, was the deepest by far. In terms of distance down the slope, it was 14,200 feet to the bottom level, which is almost three miles. It took an hour to get down to the mines to where you were half an hour down the main slope and a half an hour down the back slope. The mine has gone so deep that the company has had to change to a different system of production to make the mine less susceptible to something the miners call a bump. A bump is actually a, a dislocation of the stratus of the earth where if you were in a mine, the floor would come up and hit the ceiling. and. Uh, if the walls were solid coal inside, they would be blasted out towards the opening. So it fills the opening. And on a global scale, we know it is an earthquake. By 1958, bumps are occurring more frequently. But miners and mine management disagree on how to handle them. It is the reason why many of the men are uneasy about going into the mine. But in a mining community like Spring Hill, there is no other choice. The mine had to keep operating because it was the sole livelihood of the town. They knew that they shouldn't really be mining at that depth for those methods, but the people had to have that employment. Miner Bowman Madison is particularly nervous. He works the three adjacent walls at the bottom level, where today, the mine is unusually quiet. It's conventional wisdom among coal miners that uh, as long as the rock is working, that is making noises and rumbling, things are fine. When things quieten down, that's often a signal that a bump is likely to occur. It is just after 8 p.m. Many families are at home watching television, including Norma Ruddick and her children. Her husband, Maurice, is working at the top of the 4,000-meter wall, bagging coal. Farther down the wall, 
Garnet Clark and Curry Smith work together. We wait for the pan engine to start up so we can put some uh, timber and stuff on the pan. We're telling a few jokes. <laughs> Minor Percy Rector digs next to a support pack of heavy timbers built up in a hollow rectangle to the roof. Not far away, Caleb Rushton chats with Bowman Madison and Gorley Kemp. It is 8.06 p.m. I was sitting with my feet out, stretched out, legs stretched out, leaning against a pack, a stone pack. And when the bump happened, it threw my head back, knocked me out. One day this broom, I had the dumped right on the beat. Very landed on top of me. The total of 1,200 feet of long wall face were destroyed. That is, the coal just uh, is shot out from the face, just like pulling out a drawer, destroying everything in its path. I heard a great big noise, and the television went out. And when the television came back on, the Dom Esser show was on. And Charlie and Marg were singing, Farther along, you'll know all about it. Farther along, you'll understand why. And in my mind, it was God trying to tell me that it would take a while before I got any news. And I'll never forget that song. October 23rd, 1958, 8.06 p.m. In the mining town of Spring Hill, a shock wave has caused buildings to shake, plaster to crack, and the town water tower to split. It uh, felt to me uh, just the same thing as if a low-flying plane had dropped uh, three bombs, and it was just crunch, crunch, crunch. Definitely three different uh, uh, sounds or feelings and we knew it was a, a bump. Hundreds joined Dr. Arnold Burden at the pit head, anxious to find out who has survived and who hasn't. There was people everywhere, reporters, and you know, it was a, a terrible place to be. You look at everybody and everybody was sad and crying. And... A team of volunteers heads into the mine, including Dr. Burden. There is so much destruction that the entrance to the 4,100 meter level is completely closed in. It was damaged so badly that we were crawling through the areas around broken packs. At the 4,200 meter level, they begin to find the bodies of those killed when the wall of coal blasted forward. We took about 90 some men out of the mine that night a lot of them injured, some of them not injured. But then there was uh, a number of men missing. In a press conference on Friday night, October 24th, Mine General Manager Harold Gordon announces that those still missing must be presumed dead. Yet far below the surface, some of the presumed dead are very much alive. I didn't hear a thing, didn't feel a thing and didn't know anything until I heard myself screaming. I realized that there was some stone across my shins. So somebody hauled it all off, and I managed to get up, but I couldn't get my cap down over my head. There was a big lump on the back of my head from hitting the pack. Close by, Maurice Ruddick is also partially buried. When the bump first happened, he was buried in coal up to his knees. So we dug himself out and he crawled around and he got with the other boys. Garnet Clark has also survived, but those below him aren't so fortunate. There's about seven that weren't alive below us. So we couldn't do much about that. Twelve men are trapped together at the bottom of the 4,000-meter level wall, including Gorley Kempt, 
Bowman Madison, and Caleb Rushton. We had a space about four feet high, four to five feet high, and it varied in length depending on where you were. Now you couldn't walk up straight, you had to bend over all the time, but at least you could move. Two of the 12 are injured. Joe McDonald is several meters from the others, a broken bone protruding from his leg. Teddy Mishniak is further up with a broken shoulder. We took the fellow with a broken shoulder. He, he walked down himself and stayed with the fellow that had the broken leg. Those who can move look for a way out. Eldred Lowther takes the lead as the men crawl over crags of rubble and squeeze through passageways barely wide enough for their shoulders. About 460 meters above the 4,000 meter level, Lowther suddenly passes out. Harold Brine grabs his ankles from behind and drags him to safety. They have hit a wall of lethal gas and can go no further. In the opposite direction, their way is blocked by a huge fall of rock and coal. They are trapped. There is little to do now but wait and deal with the sudden loss of friends and family. Fred Hunter grieves for twin brother Frank, whose body he's sure he saw buried in the ruins. Fred Hunter doesn't realize that seven more survivors are trapped just 90 meters away cut off from the 12 by a huge wall of uprooted rock. They include Maurice Ruddick, Garnet Clark, and Frank Hunter, still very much alive. They too have an injured companion, Percy Rector, his arm caught in a crushed pack of timber. When the bump occurred, he must have been leaning against a pack or driven against a pack and his elbow uh, was caught between the wood and just crushed down and his elbow was crushed and he was trapped there. The pain is unbearable and Percy pleads with his friends to cut off the arm to free him. We found the thaw that had the hammer on him. Just for the plate of that. Couldn't get no good tools. We started to. We kind of gave up, I said, see what I can get there. It's all in that. That evening, Maurice Ruddock hears sounds coming from beyond their crowded chamber. He and Garnet Clark bang on a section of cast iron pipe, hoping to attract attention. There's a pipe turned down the wall. We banged on them, banged on them, we pretty near crazy. We didn't get no answer. Saturday, October 25th, 1958. The eyes of the world are on Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, as the media report the biggest story of the year. By Saturday, the group of 12 miners trapped underground has run out of food and water. Gorley Kempt and Eldred Lowther volunteer to explore for the water and food cans of dead companions. Gorley Kemp kept us all in good spirits, and he also kept a level head on him. He kept getting us to go try to find another way out, which he knew very well he wouldn't be able to do, but it, it gave us something to do for the time being. On Tuesday, October 28th, his arm still trapped in the shattered pack, Percy Rector dies from his injuries. By now, the six left behind spend their time pounding on pipes and listening to the sound of rescue workers as it echoes through the ruptured mine. You can hear them working away in a long way, it's not cold. You can hear them. To lift their spirits, Maurice Ruddock leads them in song. That family is always pretty good at singing. 
I finally got to call him a thing of mine. Above ground, manager Harold Gordon reports that rescue crews are making very slow progress. He said nobody would be alive. So probably a lot of the people in town would feel the same way, you know. So they must have thought that there was no hope for anybody. Wednesday, October 29th, 1958. Six days have passed since the explosion in the Spring Hill Mine. 81 men have been rescued, 26 are confirmed dead, and 67 are still missing. Less than 60 meters from the coal face on the 4,100 meter level, rescue workers uncover a broken air pipe. At 2.30 p.m., surveyor Blair Phillips places a light at the end of the air pipe. It shines through to the cavern on the other side, and Phillips hears Gorley Kemp call out, there are 12 of us here. Blair, in a state of uh, shock, uh, told them not to go anywhere. <laughs> of course, they hadn't gone anywhere for five and a half days. The discovery of survivors gives rescue teams renewed energy as they dig a one by one meter tunnel towards the men. And when, <clears throat> when the breakthrough came, it was just a blast of dust and air for a few minutes and then we went into where they were. They carried us out through the little stretchers, but they had to go on their knees pretty near to get us. I don't know how they managed it, but they did. For Spring Hill, the rescue is nothing short of miraculous. But for some, the miracle brings disappointment. I was home in the house when I had the TV on and said they had found a 12 men and they were bringing them up. So I think after the fourth man they brought up, I don't know why, but I thought to myself, Reese is not in that group, and he wasn't. Saturday, November 1st, 1958. It has been eight days since the collapse of the number two mine. Underground at the 4,000 meter level, several men are still trapped. Not far away, a rescue worker hears a call for help. We've seen their lights coming up for a while. They holler, how many is there? We said seven. For the six trapped men, it's as if angels have dropped from heaven. Oh, we have all one happy thing. We knew it would be our way out on the lot from there down all the wall, about 20 or 30 feet. And they put us on a stretcher and carried the rest of the way. Well, they had our eyes covered, but I peeked. This is all the sunlight and all the animals. Gang the house, he said, We found them. And I said, Is he alive? And he said, Yes. So we both start crying. <laughs> he was very thin when he came out. So good to see his face. Did you ever give up hope for your husband? No, not for a moment. Frank Hunter is the last of the living brought to the surface. Twin brother Fred waits for him at the hospital. It is the last miracle for the town of Spring Hill. There will be no more survivors. On Thursday, November 6th, the last body is brought from the mine. His widow waits for him at the pit head, her hope finally gone. A lot of the men that didn't come out, that left wives and children, mothers who lost sons, I don't know, I don't know how they cope with it. I don't think I could have. 
On November 12th, owners of the Spring Hill Mine announced that number two will not be reopened. It was a loss of, uh, of the last employment they were in the town, and they could have got other seams uh, if they really wanted to, but they didn't, uh, they didn't do anything about it. The final death toll is 75. A royal commission finds no official cause for the bump and absolves the company of any wrongdoing. But experts now believe that the collapse was the result of a combination of factors. One was the, the thickness of the coal seam, the fact that the coal itself was strong. The great depth of the mine is also a, a major factor because of the increasing overburden load on the coal face. In the 82-year history of the Spring Hill Mines, 443 men and boys lost their lives, and a town lost its way of life. When the mines were closed, there was just no work, and uh, many uh, people had to move away to find jobs in the States or Ontario, wherever they could. They remember the war here, and the men that fought in the war, so why can't we remember our men that worked in the mine. They remember the ones that come out and they remember the ones that didn't come out alive.